Hello, everyone. It is day three of Novel Writing Month, 3rd of November. Something else is happening in the world right now, but we're going to keep it laser-focused. We're going to keep it cozy here. Um, spirits are still high. We actually finished really early today. Uh, I was My plan to schedule sessions better didn't work, but just got through it. Uh, we are only slightly over the, uh, I think we're nine words over the, the quarter for today. But, you know, we'll take that. Win's a win. And, uh, yeah, before we start, just so I don't forget, because I very rarely, it turns out, can keep more than one thought in my head at a time. Um, for next time, going to have to work out what the baddie looks like. We, we've got... Um, in my mind, we're trying to keep pace going. We were very focused on pace. We're gonna have to encounter complications soon, and we're gonna need to pick what form those take. That's the possibly for next time, possibly the time after that. But we need to have it settled what we're what the villain's gonna look like. Anyway, for now, we're picking up right where we left off. We're going to cause a scene, Zach told her. We're going to handcuff ourselves to your boss, and we're going to fucking waterbomb people with slime out the river. Oh, April shoved him aside with a firm settle down. That's, uh... <laughs> I've been listening to 372 Pages podcast, and I knew at some point in the story there was going to need to be a firm settle down. So we've got it out of the way here. He wasn't helping. The receptionist looked back to April for an explanation of Zack's weird outburst. If there's anything we could do to get near someone important, in a way that won't come back on you, we'd like to hear about it, she explained courteously. We do plan on making a scene. There was a pretty good chance the woman simply wouldn't be able to help them, but April was hopeful. She again felt the kinship she shared with this receptionist, as just for a moment, the disgruntled woman scanned back through her own fantasies of pe petty revenge against the management. You'd get in trouble, she decided. April smiled. They were in. We are always in trouble. What have you got? Got the receptionist right out of the way. Just whoosh, straight past. I think that conversation does does add something. We'll, we'll add it in the future, but I, I think it's the best grasp of characters you've got so far of any of the characters. Hello, this is Rob. I'm calling from Cooper Booth. Have you... What? Hello, this is Rob. I'm calling from Cooper Booth. Have you... Where? Cooper Booth. Have you... Hello? Hello, this is Rob. I'm calling from Cooper Booth. Have you... Is anyone there? I'm here. Hello, I'm Rob. I'm here and I'm calling from Cooper Booth. Have you... She hung up. Rob crossed another name off his list, input the details of the attempted call into the system, updated his timesheet to reflect the fact it had happened, and then slammed his face into the keyboard. It honestly didn't make him feel any better, and the keyboard didn't work quite as well afterwards. Once the ritual was completed, he dialed in the next number. He couldn't stop making phone calls just because his phone didn't work, and he had no way to communicate with the pot potential customers at all. Consumers at all. And this, I just want to say before we get into it, this was me trying to write very late at night, um, like half asleep. And sometimes that's when I do some of my best writing, and sometimes it's when I do my worst rambling. So we'll see how this turned out. The phone rang three times before someone picked up. Is that you, Dave? No, this is Rob. I'm calling from... They'd already hung up. Truth be told, he kind of liked his job slightly better when his phone didn't work. He didn't really know what they were selling, he just read off the script. But he was pretty sure it was some kind of scam. No sale. Bad connection. Less than one minute. Okay. The machine f froze as he tried to confirm the details, as it tended to do about a third of the time. Rather than just use Excel or something sensible, everything was recorded in some awful, ancient, in-house... Should be a comma here. Ah, <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe not. We'll, we'll put one there for now awful, ancient, in-house program that functioned about as well as his phone. The keyboard, my keyboard is actually broken and it misses letters sometimes. It locked up constantly, and if he filled in the wrong option, 
if you filled in the wrong option in any of the checkboxes or any of the details didn't go through after a particularly lengthy th freeze, he had to talk to an administrator to get that farm fixed. This happened in real life. Both the timesheet and the call log operated off entirely different programs, both ones that didn't work properly and he'd never previously heard of. Each had its own unique set of crippling problems. He dialed the next number. By the way, there's like, this is a real thing. There's like weird scammers who sell companies these garbage programs that barely work with the promise that like, oh, we don't have any, no one else uses this. So if you have problems, you'll have a direct line to us. But the reason no one else uses it is because like Microsoft Excel exists or uh, Access or whatever. Like just, <laughs> just use the thing that already works. He dialed the next number. The phone rang to voicemail. I, this is really bad, these three really short sentences. I don't like it. This too needed to be logged meticulously. The thought that this couldn't possibly be normal, that something was fundamentally wrong with the world, or at least with civilization as it existed, was one that nagged constantly at the back of his mind during work hours. Humanity was bullshit. Just what kind of weird hairless ape would think this was a valuable way to spend time? Rob got paid to do this. At least when the many f tiny fines he accrued during a day had a total value of less than his wage. Does anyone else notice that this isn't okay? His phone had a row of tiny indents along both ends of the receiver. Clearly some form of damage. And Robert spent a... I don't know if there should be a comma here. Or, and Robert spent a week or so wondering what, he could have, what could have caused them. Eventually he came to the realisation that they were bite marks. Presumably caused by the man who'd eaten his own hands. Or maybe the guy before him. Or the guy before him. Turnover tended to be high. The mark they'd left endured as a symbol of their frustrations, presumably the same ones Rob felt every day. Somewhere in the world, there existed a kindred spirit. Yeah, I get esoteric when I'm very tired. <laughs> the next one he picked the next one picked up while he wasn't ready, and they'd already hung up before he had a chance to speak. He chucked it up to a bad connection. He should make a cast of the marks. That that's the marks on the phone. I think I forgot I had this little bit in the middle. That way he might one day be able to track down the man or woman who made them, and the two could discuss the general hostility of the planet they lived on as the only two lucid dreamers in a communal nightmare. <laughs> I kind of liked this one. Around. The only two lucid dreamers in a communal nightmare. Yeah, I think I'll keep that. <laughs> he dialed the next number. The phone rang only half of a tone before someone picked up. Rob spoke automatically. Hello, this is Rob. I'm calling from... A moment of confused silence ensued, followed by a high. Hang up the phone, you idiot. I'm trying to call an ambulance. Sorry, he did as, he did as introduced. As soon as the receiver clicked down, he realized he'd made another mistake. You weren't supposed to hang up before the other person unless you'd caused a sale. Worse, the system could detect when you had done. He was going to hear from Gary about that. And that's the end of the scene. This last bit probably doesn't need to be here. We, we could probably have ended it at the only two lucid dreamers in a communal nightmare, but... You know, um, we put this bit in just in case we couldn't think of a way to progress the story and Gary was forced to confront Rob. Because at some point, Rob needs to go upstairs. And then the next bit's uh, scene saying, world building? I don't know. Um, worried this is a bit long, but also... We'll see. We haven't read it yet. The Cooper Booth... By the way, I keep thinking this should this should be Booth Cooper. I think I had it as Booth Cooper and then switched it, and now I'm like, bro, it should be Booth Cooper. The Cooper Booth building had existed for maybe a hundred... A hundred... A hundred what? A hundred what, buddy? Maybe a hundred years in some form or another, but being completely rebuilt from the ground up sometime in the early 60s. By now... The form of the jagged, foreboding tower looming over the city's skyline was a known quantity, and although as time has marched on, other structures in the vicinity had grown to similar heights, none were quite as iconic or foreboding. All this was known. The building took the form of a giant, ugly concrete slab that was menacing to behold beyond its horrific ugliness in ways that were difficult to define. People would subconsciously plan their routes to avoid seeing it on their way to work, and grow uneasy around its base. Nobody tended to think any more of it, though. 
Cooper Booth was the kind of brand that had grown to such a size that it produced more money than it would ever be, a, be possible to spend. If the way they wanted to flaunt that wealth was to erect a concrete monstrosity all the way up to the planet's upper atmosphere, then as good capitalists, they were within their rights to do it. This too was known. Zachary Morgan made the tenuous claim to be an expert in certain occult fields, and claimed he knew better. From below, the building was a savage... I called it jagged twice. It's fine. Savage, jagged mess... I'll fix the letter. <laughs> jagged mess that appeared from certain angles to be in danger of toppling catastrophically over. I, str I tripped over this for like... I don't know why, but the description of the building looking like it might fall over. I, I couldn't do it. I, just, I don't know what was wrong. It's like the one place I got stuck uh, today. From above, though, the structure made a certain kind of sense to a certain kind of person. Quite intentionally, the building had been meticulously shaped to reflect the image of an occult rune up into the heavens, its meaning being something along, along the lines of misery or despair. Cooper Booth had been designed to fit as many people into it as possible, and then create and cultivate those same emotions in its inhabitants. And I meant to... It's a bit silly, but the, the whole thing we're doing here is a bit silly. Um, I also meant to... I meant to put this in, and I will forget, so I do have to say it. I wanted to point out that, like, even though when you're inside the building, it seemed like a chaotic, me chaotic mess of angles just in the middle of nowhere. Um, when you look at it from above, it's it's rotationally symmetrical. When you look at it from above, and there's no clutter in the way, there's not cubicles and desks everywhere. Um, we'll probably include that at some point. Not a lot of people knew that, but if April and Zach were among the few. In the same way that it's difficult to have a good time around someone who's miserable, or it's difficult to be miserable around a lot of people who are having a good time, getting a thousand people in one small space and turning them all into anguished, loathsome husks of people creates a certain kind of vibe, and that vibe can work a certain kind of magic under certain conditions. That was how Zach had explained it. April tended not to ask too many questions. The answers was when Eh, the answers were normally just as stupid. The rundown of the situation, as April had understood it, was that A, the vibes put out by the Cooper Booth building were powerfully toxic. B, this had been done on purpose by people who wanted to use the negative energy they're in to do something. And C, whatever they did was likely to be really horrible. The building had more secrets than that, however. Back around the time of the Second World War, Cooper Booth had been a much smaller, relatively benign, aspiring capital for the occult within Northern England. For the longest time, it was simply a location where honest rich folk could go to meet their peers, rub shoulders with powerful individuals, and perform blood sacrifices to the old gods. When everything kicked off and bombs started dropping, they worried their building, outwardly opulent as it was, might become a target of opportunity for stray German bombers. Naturally, there was only one course of action to take. They dug down under the earth, creating a massive, metal-lined shelter proof from bomb and sh shrapnel. Determined to live in no less finery than they had on the surface, the members of Cooper Booth had carved out a deep scar of gloomy catacombs into the earth, sparing no expense on its furnishings. The building itself became abandoned, the expansive network of tunnels proving to be beyond serviceable for their purposes. You never had to worry about an accidental ray, an accidentally ray of, of light, of natural light sneaking in through the blinds, ruining a perfectly good ritual. And the acoustics were excellent. After the war, once the Cold War had started to calm down a little in the early 60s, I realized I knew this line was in here somewhere and I needed to fix it. Um, but I couldn't find it when I skimmed through. So well, this is this will be changed in the finished version. It, maybe we should move it. We could have it in the 80s or something when they rebuilt the building. It doesn't matter. They turned their attention back to the old, disused surface part of the building, eventually turning into the ridiculous abomination visible today from just about anywhere in the city. The tunnels, now themselves abandoned, hadn't simply gone away, though. This was the part they hadn't known, but the receptionist had. A couple of streets away from the base of the tower was a small, fenced-off structure, basically four square brick walls and a door like a Minecraft house. It was innocuous enough that you'd never find it if you didn't already know it was there. And that's where we're up to, folks. So I don't... Yeah, I think we're doing all right with pace. Um, 
I kind of like the weird world build. I like to just throw in a little bit here and there if it's sufficiently odd. And um, this all comes from when I wrote the original thing. There was just like, they just. I used to write in a really weird, dreamlike way where basically any space anyone entered was infinite. So there was like a basement that they were just walking through for like a whole chapter or something. It was just vast. And um, I don't know, I started thinking like, well, how could there ever be a basement this, this ridiculous? <laughs> and I started to think of like reasons why such a structure might, might exist. Anyway, I think we're up a word or two. Yeah, we're up one word. So we're now uh, uh, 5,427. Whoops. I put that on the wrong day. Got to keep myself honest. That was that was a yesterday's word. And we have an hour before the next one. We don't have to immediately jump back into it today. I also had time to record another video, so look forward to that. We are looking through the Dark Elder Codex that I've got. Excuse me. Yeah, today's been good. Um, I think I got through it. I think that's all right. We'll have to get rid of the uh, mention of the Cold War ending in the early 60s, but you know. <laughs> Other than that, we're doing pretty good. We've got to, we've got to work out what form the 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 old god's gonna take. I might change that. Um, that's a really silly sentence, but I really like it, and I think it's quite snappy. It's some kind of like demonic horror. It doesn't necessarily need to be an old god. So we don't need to lean that much into into the Cthulhu mythos. Um. The previous one was heavily based in the Cthulhu mythos, heavily rooted in it. It was a, a part-side town that was adjacent to a Halloween-themed resort. And I really like the saying, and maybe one day we'll try and write previous, but for now we have to act like it didn't happen. We can't try and like carry over development that never occurred. I don't know. Um, I was gonna say something. Yeah, I had I had a weird idea for the for the villain in that it was like an alien uh, consciousness that it didn't understand really planets. It didn't understand war. Didn't know that it could hurt. And it um ended up at the bottom of the ocean dead, but somehow connected to a a town of people. And then eventually, it kind of. Uh, sucked in all the surrounding sea life and regenerated itself into a ball of meat. So, you know, kinda kinda Cthulhu, but also kinda not. I mean very Cthulhu, but also my own ball of meat spin on things. Something being just a giant shambling husk made of dead fish is not actually that that's pretty Cthulhu. Anyway, yeah, this one's gone a bit short. That's fine. Um, we definitely don't want them all to be half an hour long. We're feeling good. Energy's high. We still haven't worked out what that guy's Twitch was, who we thought we'd um, followed. But we'll get there, and we'll, we'll add it to the description on the second one. Yeah, that's me for today. Uh, good luck with your own writing, if you are indeed writing. Thanks for being here.